I need you to do something for me for the next 15 minutes. No matter what I do or say, do not turn off this Bible study. Let it run the entire 15 minutes, okay? Now promise me that. Don't touch that remote. Don't click that button. Spit shake, pinky swear. Do not turn this off. Listen to me for the whole 15 minutes. Okay, you promise that. Here's the reason why I said that, because I want us to talk about the election. President Trump and President-elect Joe Biden, no, just kidding, just kidding, I'm not going to talk about that. Breathe. Breathe. Just relax. Breathe. Okay. The election I want to talk about is has even more controversy than that. What? Where? Who? Well, the Senate race in Georgia. Just kidding. Take a breath. The Senate race in Kentucky. No. Take a breath. I tell you the cliffhanger, it was the Horse Cave City Council. No, I'm not talking about that either. Really, the election I'm talking about didn't happen in the United States. Well, it didn't happen in Europe either. Actually, it didn't happen anywhere in the world. The election I'm talking about happened a long time ago, and it's affected you and I. We've learned about this election by reading the Bible. Yes, I'm going there, and you promise don't turn me off. We're going to talk about election. Election is a biblical doctrine that's hard to understand, and some people have an emotional response the minute they hear this negative, negatively. Again, just breathe. Just listen and breathe. Since it's in the Bible, I think it's important that we at least talk about it. You don't have to agree with everything that people say about election, but neither can you in good conscience deny or ignore the fact that election is talked about in the Bible. In fact, every New Testament author mentions election. It's a doctrine whereby God chooses those for salvation, and He did it before the very beginning of the world. Last week we began a study in the book of 2 Timothy, and we're going to do it on Sunday mornings and on these Wednesday night Bible studies. Last year, 2019, we went through 1 Timothy verse by verse, and we saw that that book was mainly about how are you to handle yourself in the house of God. How are we to handle ourselves in the household of faith? He talked about how we are to organize worship services, who should be involved and who maybe doesn't need to be involved. Uh, we talked about how the qualifications of pastors and deacons are listed. Uh, we talked about, as we read further into it, how to spot and deal with false teachers and deviations from sound doctrine. We even talked about how do you handle mercy ministries, how do you handle finances of the church, how do you handle personal finances. And it finished up the book with an encouragement to keep fighting the good fight of faith. Second Timothy takes on a different tone. It takes on a different subject. And here's basically the subject. Stay faithful even if you have to suffer for the gospel. And how do you do that? Now again, we as Americans technically have not really suffered for our faith a lot. But you never know what's coming. As our nation continues to struggle with such a divide between people, that religious liberty could very easily come to the forefront. We could start finding ourselves in a difficult spot when it comes to being a Christian. How do you handle that? What do you do when you come under that kind of a pressure? How do you keep going on? Here's what it is. You have to find your motivation. People that go through serious illness, if they don't have a motivation to live, many of them won't. You have to have a reason to keep fighting, to keep going. What is your reason what is your motivation to keep you faithful to Jesus, no matter what? You and I both have seen many people who start off great, who even had fruitful ministries, and then something happened, and it just dropped out, and you don't know where they are. Why? What happened? They lost their motivation. They no longer had a why to answer their what. What am I going through? Why am I going through that? What am I willing to do to stay strong? So let's take some time to think about where do we get the confidence to keep going on, where do we get the motivation during hard times and stay faithful to Christ. 
I'm in 2 Timothy. Let's go through just a few verses in chapter 1, and then we're going to dip into chapter 2. The first one he gives is found in the very first verse. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, listen, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. The promise of life. This promise is found in Christ alone. There is nothing that you and I have done or can do that will assure us that we have now the promise of life, and it's life everlasting. That's a great motivation to keep hanging in there with Jesus. Then chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Who has called us, who has saved us, and has brought us into a different world. Do you realize all of us have a calling? Now, I'm not talking about a calling to be a pastor or a calling to be a music minister. I'm talking about the Christian life is a calling. You are called to follow Christ. You are called to be an imitator of Christ. All of us have a calling from God. We all kind of work it out in different ministries, but every Christian has a holy calling upon their life. The Holy Spirit is teaching us how to grow up. He's showing us how to work out the old life and work into the new life. And He's going to keep working on us until we look like Jesus. God is not so much concerned about our comfort as much as He is that we look like His Son, Jesus. His own purpose of grace. You have not experienced salvation mainly because of what you've done. It's because of what He has done. Gave us before time began. Before creation, God the Father knew you, called you to be His prized possession. You just didn't realize it until you said yes one day. Verse 12. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard that which I entrusted to him for that day. Paul is telling us not to be ashamed to suffer for the gospel because the gospel is worth it. Plus he's convinced that Christ's faithfulness will get us through anything we may lose or anything we may experience. You will never need this truth driven deeper into your heart, mind, and spirit more than when you begin to face persecution because of who you are as a Christian. Now's the time to allow the Spirit to drive it into our hearts. Now we're going to dip into chapter 2, and here's where I want us to take the rest of our time. He gives us another motivation in chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David, this is my gospel of which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now the motivation he gives here are the, are the ones that remind us to stay faithful to Christ because of his faithfulness to us. First he lists the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the centerpiece of everything we believe. Since that happened, our life has changed. If that didn't happen, then nothing has changed. So motivation number one, the resurrection. Secondly, Jesus is the offspring of David. Now how does that affect us? It shows us that Scripture is trustworthy. The Old Testament said it, the New Testament had happened, and the scriptures are true then, the scriptures are true today. You can trust them. Here's the third one, for the sake of the elect. Now that's interesting. What are you willing to suffer for the people that God has placed His love on? How much are you willing to suffer for another Christian? How much are you willing to suffer for the church? Paul says, I'm willing to do everything for the elect, and that is the saved. Well, here's the question. Who is the elect? Those whom God has chosen for himself before the foundation of the world. Let's just dip our toe into Titus. Listen to Titus chapter 1, verses 1 through 
verses 1 through 3. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, a faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and at his appointed season he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God, our Savior. Here's the thing, guys. Your salvation didn't start when you said yes. It's been going on for a long, long time. And understanding the word elect. Again, every author in the New Testament used the word, and they didn't even hesitate. They didn't really even define it. They just stated it as a fact. Just like the Bible does not take the time to try to defend God, it just stated as a fact. So, I have a series of questions here that I have found to be very helpful, especially when it comes to how do I deal with this idea of election. And let me just walk through these questions, and you answer them in your mind, okay? Especially if you have a hard time with this subject. Do I believe in the Bible? Well, yes. Is God good, just, merciful, gracious? Yes. Do I believe something? Do I have to believe something for it to be true? Well, no, not really. It's true whether I believe it or not. Am I willing to believe those things even if I never understand them? That's a challenge. Does the Bible teach election? Well, yes. Do I understand everything about election? <laughs> Absolutely not. Am I willing to believe what the Bible teaches about election even if I never understand it? There's the challenge. Will all people be saved? Well, no. All of us are, would agree to that. Unless you're a universalist, we realize not everybody's going to be saved. Do I know who individually will be saved or lost? Well, no, I don't know that either. Is salvation man-centered or God-centered? Uh, you got us there. It's God-centered. Who began salvation in my life? Me or the Father? Well, the Father did. Did God the Father know before I was born that I would be saved? If He's sovereign, the answer has to be yes. Do I have a free will or a freed will? Am I a free moral agent? Well, that's... That's a whole nother Wednesday night Bible study. We'll talk about that later. Do I believe God is sovereign? That He can do anything He chooses to do with that question? Is God fair? What about Job? What about Christ on the cross? How much influence does God have in my decision-making process? Some people say, well, I'm not, I'm not a puppet on a string. Well, you may be more than you realize, and the devil may be playing you. Ephesians chapter 2 says that I was dead in trespasses and sin before I was saved. So, what choice does a dead man have? None. In the Old Testament, the Jews, or the Hebrew people, were the chosen people of God, the elect. Do you have any problem believing or accepting that? Well, no. Do I have a problem with God choosing a people today for the same purpose? Well, Today, who are the elect? Is it Israel or is it someone else? At any moment of salvation, could I have said no and walked away? I don't know what it was like when you were saved, but I know that once the process had started, I don't think I could have walked away. If I choose to believe and be saved, can I then choose to believe or not believe and be lost? That's another good 15-minute Bible study. Why am I a believer? Why was I saved? Is it because I grew up in America? What must I do then? What must I do when I see an apparent contradiction in Scripture? Well, I'll tell you one thing you don't do. You don't doubt the Scriptures. You doubt your view of it. Did God choose me for salvation or did I choose God? What is election? And again, do I believe the Bible? Well, that was fun. Why don't we do that again sometime? Let's pray together. Father, these are the deep things that only reside in your heart and mind. 
And yet, Lord, you've written them down for us to study and to think about. Well, help us to accept what we do not yet quite grasp, knowing it came from your all-wise, all-knowing, all-powerful mind. Father, whatever you have made in us definitely came by grace. And we thank you for your grace. So, Father, thank you for helping us to have this election. In Jesus' name, amen.